everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley. Chris Connolly here. Great to see you all. Lainey Mays. Good to see you. Good to see you. And today we are joined by two authors uh, who have books coming out in the next couple of months. One is fiction, one is nonfiction. The connective tissue here being uh, a thrill for the wilderness is I think uh, how we could best describe this. We have uh, Blair Braverman, whose uh, book Dogs on the Trail is uh, a, her memoir uh, based on dog sledding. And we have Alice Henderson, author of A Blizzard of Polar Bears is, is the follow-up to her debut novel, uh, A Solitude of Wolverines, a suspense series. Um, we are so excited to have both of you on today. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. This is wonderful to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're thrilled. So just, you know, we're, what we'll do is, um, you know, just a quick chat and then uh, we'll start talking to Blair and Alice will go into the virtual green room and eat virtual, I don't know, I always say M&Ms, but maybe it could be virtual acorns. I don't even know. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll reverse. But uh, it's so much fun to have you both on. You've not met each other until just now. But I just think it's so interesting that um, the, the books that you have written, and as I say, this connective tissue between these two books are very different, but in some sense, they are uh, very much alike because you both have this uh, great history uh, and um, great behind the book stories to tell about uh, what you do and your, um, your writings and your love for the outdoors and nature, which have informed your books. So here we have Blair, you gorgeous cover, Dogs on the Trail, A Year in the Life. This is just, images are just stunning in this book, and we'll get to that. Um, and you've written, written this with your husband, Kins Mountain. And Alice Henderson, A Blizzard of Polar Bears. This is a novel of suspense, and this is the follow-up to Solitude of Wolverines, which, God, boy, you get so many great, both of, both of your uh, previous books received such uh, great reviews. And so to have you back here with new uh, books coming out this fall is just so exciting and we can't wait to talk to both of you about these titles so um, I'll turn it over to you for a second or three and then uh, and then uh, Blair will start with you in the interview so is there anything that you all want to say or before we get started well, I want to uh, say Blair it's so cool to meet you and I've read your work on outside and New York Times and that piece you wrote on outside about being a woman alone in the wilderness that just really resonated with me. I love that piece, so. Oh, thank you so much. I am so happy to meet you too. I love your title. As soon as I saw it in the email, I was I obsessed. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> thank you so much. That's great, that's great. Yeah, if we can put that uh, piece, um, we'll try and find that piece and put it in the chat before the hour is up. Um, so that'd be fun. Um, okay, and you know what, I just, where are you both, where are you both right now? I am in Lake Tahoe right now in the mountains. With the smoke. With the smoke. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Rough stuff. Yeah. And Blair? I'm in uh, northern Wisconsin. And uh, I, I warned Virginia when I first came on here that we're currently having a thunderstorm. And our power network is very tenuous up here. So there are moderate odds that I will suddenly disappear and I don't have phone reception and I really am sorry if that happens but um hopefully the clouds will part and uh the satellites will come through clearly we're live and we're viewable is that correct we're viewable we're up we're in the world oh my God. I suppose. I... sorry about that everyone see it. I confirm <laughs> all right so thanks for staying with us during those technical difficulties I think you probably all heard our intro and Alice and Blair talking with each other a little bit about, um, you know, reading each other's um, material and just getting acquainted and where we are from and where they're from. Thank you, Chris. Here again is ja Alice's uh, book jacket, Blair's book jacket, Dogs on the Trail. Look at that face. Look at that face. A year in the life. Blair Braverman and her husband, Kins Martin. And Alice Henderson, A Blizzard of Polar Bears, follow up to her 
uh, debut novel in this suspenseful series uh, featuring Alex Carter, A Solitude of Wolverines. Both, as I was saying before, uh, both of you, your previous books really hit the ground running. Um, uh, and so you're both picking up on um, sort of the same themes, one fiction, one nonfiction. Again, can't get it out of my head because I uh, feel like the, the line is thin between the two because you both know what you write. Um, and so um, uh, why don't we, because we had a little time chewed up with the Facebook, Facebook uh, flaw, we'll just get right to it. So um, we're going to start with uh, Blair Braverman to talk about her book. And so Alice Henderson, we will talk to you in a little bit. Uh, so just sit back, relax, and um, see you soon. Okay, see you then. Okay. Hey, Blair. Hey. We'll talk fast before the rains come. All right, I'm on. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, I honestly, I'm like, so flustered at the thought that I'm talking to so many librarians because I I just grew up. I spent so many hours a day in libraries. Um, in college, I was voted most likely to be found in the library at any time. Oh my and God. I just love libraries so much. <laughs> Wherever I go, I get a library card first thing. So Do I'm you? super so excited. Oh, wow. um, and thank you all for your work. And um, yeah, and thank you for the introduction. So this book, Dogs on the Trail, I wanna say also it's co-written with my husband, Quince Mountain, um, and he couldn't be here today, but he is here in spirit. And this cover photo, so it's actually a book of photos and text. And this cover photo is taken by a friend of ours, Nathaniel Wilder. Um, so just a little bit about it. I live in Northern Wisconsin in a town of about 500. Uh, it's the kind of town where, um, you know, if you need your hair cut, <laughs> you like go to the undertaker because he learned how to cut hair in mortu mortuary school. Like it's a very small town and close knit and um, uh, pretty, pretty rural. And I'm a dog sledder. I've been dog sledding for 15 years since I was 18. And about six years ago, six or seven years ago, my husband and I got our first dogs. Um, and since then, we now have uh, about 24 dogs. And I say about because sometimes we have fosters or we have a friend's dog staying with us or our dog staying with a friend. Um, but we have uh, 24 sled dogs and we travel all over North America with them. And we've just gotten to do some incredible things. Um, and when, when we first got dogs, you know, I, I got into mushing um, when I was a teenager because I went to a socialist dog sledding boarding school in the Norwegian Arctic and um, got hooked from there and worked as a wilderness guide and um, also always loved storytelling. And so when I started working with my own dogs, because I'd always worked with other people's sled dogs for a long time, you know, you can like if you wanna be a musher, the best way to do it is to like volunteer to scoop poop for somebody who's gonna let you, you know, get some dog time in exchange for helping out on the many, many chores that having this many dogs entails. Um, I started, uh, I actually, I, it was when I was first starting to write professionally, um, you know, do some freelance work and people told me I had to get on Twitter, which I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I did, and I tried very hard to be like a professional writer on Twitter. <laughs> I was just out of um, my MFA and just trying to be like very serious. So I'd be taken seriously as a writer. And I would sort of try to be this serious writer um, in this very sort of like what I as an MFA student had imagined serious writers to be. Um, and then I would like go out and mush through the woods for hours at the end of every day. And we'd, you know, I'd go out with the dogs and we'd encounter moose and we'd get, you know, cross rivers and, um, you know, we'd, I'd get followed by wolves for miles. Um, and eventually I just sort of like caved and started posting dog pictures on Twitter <laughs> because that's what I wanted to talk about. And it, it felt very self-indulgent, like, like I'd like pulled out my wallet. Oh my gosh, oh, that that is from today. <laughs> um, I really felt like I'd pulled out my wallet and like was imposing baby photos on everyone around me, whether they liked it or not. Um, 
And then to my surprise, people started to follow the dog team and didn't actually think I was less of a writer for really geeking out over Huskies. Um, and it, it really grew into something incredible, you know, um, as I started doing longer races, I, at first I was like, I'm not going to race. I'm not going to race because I felt, and I still feel that of course, it's not about how fast your dogs are. And, you know, every dog is a winner. And why would you go to a competition when it's about something that's just about the love of the dogs and the love of the trail? Um, but I started going to sort of regional races in Wisconsin and just sort of learned more what they were about. And it wasn't, you know, in my mind, I'd been like, oh, a dog sled race, that's, you know, it's gotta be people just like turning their dogs into some sort of like item of competition, <laughs> um, like race cars or something, that's not what it's about. But as soon as I got involved, I realized it was just, you know, mushing is such a solitary life. You're out there by yourself all the time and mushers live far apart from each other because we're all so rural. And it was just a chance to come together with other mushers and like your dogs are seeing their cousins and you're all telling stories. And um, there's like a trail that's 30 miles long or 300 miles long that's like beautiful and groomed. And someone has made sure that like there aren't trees falling across it mostly. Like it's so rare to get that kind of trail. You know, we bring a chainsaw in the sled for all the problems we're gonna encounter along the way. Um, and I told myself when I started racing and, and when my husband and I were, you know, started going to these events that I would just um, try doing very short things like 20 miles, 30 miles, things you could do in two to three hours because they go about 10 miles an hour. And, um, and I just thought, you know what, I'll do longer and longer races until I stop wanting to be at the, on the trail when I hit the finish line. Um, because every time I hit the finish line, I didn't want it to be over and my dogs would be barking and jumping and they wanted to keep running too. And, um, in that way, we started doing like hundred mile races and 300 mile races. Uh, I completed my first Iditarod in 2018, I believe. Um, and the dog on the cover of the book is, is Peppy. She led basically a thousand miles in single lead, which means that, um, she led the team by herself. She actually, she's incredibly smart. She's like frighteningly smart, this girl. And she is smarter than her peers. And so she finds it very annoying to have to run next to another dog because um, she doesn't wanna, when she's focusing, she doesn't wanna be like teaching someone who's worse than her. She just wants to be able to do her thing. Um, you know, and, and we had fans of the team who called themselves the ugly dogs, uh, you know, who started following along and they were raising money for causes along the trail. And it just became this incredible phenomenon that was sort of the opposite of what I expected when I just started, you know, posting pictures to nobody of being in the woods in my backyard with my dogs. So this book um, is sort of like, it's a record of that journey um, and it's in photos and it's in text and it basically follows our dog team, which is called Braver Mountain Mushing, um, a combination of my husband's and my last names uh, throughout a year because people think of mushing as just a winter sport, but you know, do dogs aren't snowmobiles. You don't park them in the garage for six months of the year. Uh, they need activity and they need love and they need adventure every day. And so it just, you know, became a record of what does a year look like with this team and what have we learned from them and, and what does life look like for these dogs and with these dogs? It's just such a gift. Um, so, so that was the project of this book and I'm, I'm really excited to share it. It's just, it's just such a, an incredible uh, journey. You learn a lot. And uh, you see how uh, how beloved they are, how um, you know. And can you talk a little bit about what it's what life is like for them? As you just mentioned, um, when it's not the winter time. I mean, how are they? You know, and how are what is life like for them and for you and your husband when you know you're in the summertime? <laughs> well, typically in the summertime, our dogs are. I hate to say this. They're very bad on leashes because they want to pull. 
they just want to pull and they're very strong. Um, so we don't like walk them on leashes because we will not be able to, it's very hard to get them to not think that they are pulling a sled, but they're very good off leash. Um, they know how to stay close to us. So we go on adventures in the woods and we go to lakes and we go to bogs and they sort of like, we usually go in groups of five to seven dogs and they sort of swarm around us and have their social interactions and, um, you know, just get to explore. And this summer we actually completed a whole new project that we've been wanting to do for a while. We built um, a series of play yards on our farm that incorporate like a playground and a pool for them. And, um, you know, like a mountain of boulders that's like eight feet tall they can climb to the top of. So that's been our current project. Um, <laughs> basically, it's, it's always a puzzle to figure out like what, what do they need? How can we give it to them? Um, they can't pull when it's above 50 degrees. They can't, it's very dangerous for them actually. Mm -hmm. um, people always think, you know, sled dogs, don't they get too cold? That's always everyone's fear. Um, they have two questions. They say, well, don't they get too cold? Especially, you know, in the kind of temperatures we're in where it can be 30, 40 below. And then the other question they ask is how, how do you make them run? And, you know, once you spend a little time with them you realize that the real questions are the opposite of those two. It's um, how do you keep them from getting too warm because they're quite comfortable in those cold temperatures but in the, in the heat they need a lot of rest and they need shade um, and they need to be able to like flop down and cool off whenever they want to. And of course the question isn't how do you make them run it's how do you make them stop because they would be running and pulling all the time if they had their choice. Let me say that this book was like a feast for the eyes of someone who just wants to roll around in dogs all the time. So it was, it's beautiful. Also all of the landscape in this book is just like feast all the way. Um, and I have so many questions. Like I just find it so in interesting and I was going to ask you like what the biggest misconception is with dogs but I think you may have covered is there are there any other big misconceptions that people ask you That's about a good question I also thank you for your kind words about the book I really want to say we are we are amateur photographers but we are lucky to be friends and with and know some incredible photographers so the photos are not all mine and my husband's. There are a number of incredibly talented people represented who were very generous to share, uh, to share their photos for this book. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to have them included and I absolutely cannot take credit. Um, oh, I, I see we have, have some here right now. Uh, the biggest misconceptions, I feel like, I think it's, it's those to, I think the biggest misconception is that the dogs are disposable. Um, you know, I'm not saying there's no one who's ever treated dogs like that, but it's everyone I know who does this does it because they love the dogs and that's the whole point. Um, it is just, it's a chance to have an incredible adventure with your best friends and we have, you know, our retirees. This girl in this photo actually is a, is a retiree now. Um, who sort of boss around everyone else and supervise all the younger dogs. And, um, you know, it's, it's a privilege to get to share um, their whole lives with them. Yeah. And I guess my big other question is people can like spectators, people can watch the, yes. the races and how can I, how can I watch these races? <laughs> Oh my gosh, you should. I don't know where, I'm assuming, uh, you know, the librarians, those of you who are watching this come from all over, but odds are actually good that there is a dog sled race near you because there are many of them that happen on dry land, on carts and on scooters, especially, you know, when winters are a little bit less reliable in a lot of places, people are really doing a lot of dry land mushing. And a lot of times it's someone, you know, people who have one or two dogs as a pet will you know, go out on weekends and do um, can across where the dogs are pulling them while they run or bike sharing where the dogs are pulling a bike. Um, so if you look up like dog sled races in your state or um, dry land mushing, you can find an event and they are so fun to go to. They're so fun. I, I, I like can't recommend it more. The only thing I'd say is that 
Um, I wouldn't recommend bringing your dog to a dog sled race because there's just going to be a lot of working dogs and um, it's like not a great place for dogs to mingle. It's not a dog park, but you know, you can go and you'll probably get to pet some dogs and you'll get to watch them in action. And it's so exciting. And your dog will want to sniff every inch of you when you get home. Uh, so you'll get to bring the adventure to them in a, in a small way. I love that. Definitely looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> so our friend and author, Lori Rader Day, brilliant mystery thriller author who we recently had on door to door she's watching and she was curious how many dogs you have total i know it fluctuates depending on who you're fostering but how many dogs do you usually have total total um all mm -hmm. right so i'll tell you a secret and the secret is you never ask a musher how many dogs they have because they will never shut up and they will talk to you for an hour about how well they have three puppies and they have like they're fostering three dogs who aren't going to be with them permanently, but they're there until they find a permanent home. And they have this many retirees, but the retirees are running and then their main team, like they will talk and talk and talk and talk. And so the secret, they will never give you a number. They will not give you a number because they will just tell stories about every single dog. And if you want that, that's great. But like, be careful, especially if you're like at a party where the person can corner you. Um, and you won't be able to get away from the musher. Like, don't do that. Um, the secret is to say, how many dogs are you feeding? And that is how you get a number. <laughs> then they'll give you a number. <laughs> um, and if you say, how many dogs are you feeding? So right now we are feeding, we have one visiting dog, so that makes it 25. Um, and <laughs> that, that's how many dogs we feed at this moment. Um, at our biggest, our team was about 30 and it's been, uh, we started, we took over a team from someone else who was getting out of the sport. So we actually started very quickly after we started getting our own dogs, we had 21. Um, so it's been about that size ever since. We do have some dogs retire. If the right home comes along, as they get older, they can like go be a pet. Um, or they might go if we have a friend with a team that does different things than our team does and a dog's a better fit for them, they might, you know, go to a friend's team. But um, for the most part, it's been a pretty steady number. There, we have another question from our friend, Kimberly McGee. Um, well, she asked how the dog's paws don't get torn up running that much, but then someone was like, booties. So she was like, okay, I get that. Um, but then are there any issues that came up um, that you've never, you never would have expected, I guess, on the trail? Oh boy, these, you gotta be careful because all of these are questions I could talk for three hours on. Um, and it's, I, I could get too nerdy about it. You would all be very bored. Um, for the paws, we don't run on gravel. We run on dirt and sand in the fall and, um, and in the spring. And then in the winter, they wear booties only in certain snow conditions. Um, and they don't keep their paws warm, but they keep snowballs from forming between their toes, which could cause irritation. Now in other snow conditions, booties might actually not help. Uh, so they might not use foot protection at all, or they might use a certain wax on their paws that helps protect them. And every dog is gonna be different and have different foot needs. We think about feet a lot um, and foot health a lot. So there isn't really a general rule. It's really, you have to know each dog and if they have sensitive skin or tough skin or um, you know what, whatever their needs are. And then what was the second question? I got too excited about feet. <laughs> the second was, is, did anything unexpected ever happen? Like totally wouldn't have expected it. I'm sure yes, there's a million, I, but. I feel like everything that happens is unexpected to a certain degree. Um, because there are so many variables in the wilderness. You have the dog's individual personalities and how they're interacting with each other and how they're interacting with the environment and with you. And you have weather and storms and um, you know wildlife and just like all these dynamics. It's like they never quite overlap in the same way each time. It's never predictable. Um, but I'll tell you my, my favorite thing that surprised me on the trail, a story that I've told before 
is one time I was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is a very, very snowy area in the Keweenaw, which has some of the heaviest snowfall in the US. And um, a very, very thick blizzard came in very suddenly. And it was so thick, you know, like the classic, you can barely see your, your mitten in front of your face. And, um, and we were mushing on a trail we didn't know that well. And so I could feel like, you know, Peppy and lead. She, she keeps going through some snow, but eventually she's slowing down and the team's slowing down. Um, and like fresh powder is gathering like a snow plow in front of the sled, but I can barely see what's happening. I'm communicating with the dogs just through the feel of the sled and the ropes connecting us. And, um, and eventually we just stopped completely. And it, 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 it wasn't too cold, but it was like quite cold. It was like 20 below, which like you, you can camp out in that and it's fine. And I've done it a lot, but like, I knew we were a couple miles from a shelter and I would have rather not slept in the snow. And um, although I don't go anywhere without supplies to camp and to take care of the dogs if we camp. Um, so I, you know, walked my way up through the snor snowstorm to the front of the team, you know, petting all the dogs as I pass. I can, I can feel like their tails thumping against me. Um, and I get to the front and it's just such a whiteout. Um, there's really no way to see where the trail is. And Peppy's very good at finding the trail with her feet, but this was a little too much for even her. So I, I thought about it and I, de I decided to move some dogs around because sometimes a different dog in lead, like I have another dog, Willow, who's Peppy's daughter, who's very, very good at breaking trail. She's very, very good at going through thick powder. And I thought, you know, like maybe she'd, she'd do well. And, um, I'm moving some dogs around entirely by feel and they're sort of like sniffing me. They, they didn't really care what was going on, but they could tell something was up. And, um, and every sort of arrangement of dogs I try, we're not moving forward and it's looking more and more like, all right, it's time to like dig a snow cave and we'll all move in and we'll be here until the storm's over. And I don't know this region. I don't know how long the storms last. Um, you know, hopefully my husband's at the other end of the trail. He'll figure out what happened and look for me in a couple of days if I'm not out. And, um, and uh, then sort of on a whim, you know, I have this one dog in the back of my team and his name is Harry. Uh, and, um, and Harry, he came to us when he was five years old with his sister, Reef Ride. They're both names af named after Beans. His full name is Harry Bartz. And, um, he has been blind since he came to us fully blind. And so he runs in the back of the team um, very, very happily and the other dogs show him where to go. And actually the, the tweet you pulled up with the dog eager to go was him. Um, it was the same dog. And so when Harry first came to us, he was five years old. We, we got him from, we got him and his whole family from a musher who retired. And I remember that musher saying like, he used to be, oh, there he is, that he used to be a lead dog before he lost his vision when he was very young. Um, so just sort of on a whim, I bring Harry up to the front of the team and I'm like, well, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. I've tried everything else at this point. And, um, and I give the command like, ready? All right, you, you guys can move forward. If you can figure it out, I'll be right here. And, um, and to my shock, the team starts to move and it doesn't just move like a few inches or a few feet, but they're, they're going slowly, but steadily. And I'm walking beside them and I can feel like they're guiding me down the trail. And, um, and Harry just kept going. Harry led us miles through the storm until we came to shelter because he was the only dog on the team who didn't rely on his vision to find the trail. We moved very slowly, but he trusted his other senses enough and he had the skills and the experience that he was able to follow a trail for miles simply by by touch and smell um that's amazing and I don't know so I I thought that was pretty wonderful I knew he was a wonderful dog but um you know he really he really saved our butts you know we could we could go on for forever but there are so many beautiful there's 150 photographs in your in your book and they're just they're stunning i mean you know it's it's no surprise that uh this came out of your twitter feed because i remember when when this book was launched I, and people were just sending it looking at the pictures you can't you know there's they're arresting they're so beautiful you know and they're and each dog has its own personality and charm and they're really they're really just so so gorgeous um we have we probably have more questions than we have time for. Um, 
uh, one of the things I I um, I don't I don't know if you touched on how um, how do you how do you manage to keep them all fed fat and sassy uh, fit fat and sassy fed. you said um, my audio yeah. is a little bit fed and fit yeah. Um, we feed them. A, there's a couple pages on feeding in the book. Feeding is something apart from feet, like paws. Food is one of the things we think about the most. They get so much food. A sled dog who's running at their capacity, you know, uh, which can be a hundred miles in a day if they are adequately trained up and conditioned, uh, burns 10,000 calories in a day. Uh, which is, and this is like a 45 pound dog, like it's an astronomical amount of food. So actually, you know, if, if I'm in a long race uh, and not every dog finishes the race, I can leave dogs with volunteers along the way and they'll meet us at the end. And um, the main reason I would do that is if a dog isn't eating as much as they're burning, then I'll say, all right, you hang out here and the volunteers will give you massages and we'll meet you at the end um, because it is so important for them to eat so much. Um, we give them very tasty food. Uh, we give them, <laughs> we will go to a grocery store and buy out all the pork chops. Um, they love chicken skin. They love chicken thighs. We'll put like, we'll sprinkle bacon in their stew if we really need to, to bribe them into eating. They eat a lot of um, scraps. We live in a hunting area. And so there are scraps from uh, typically venison and bear uh, that are hunted for human food around here, but then there are parts that humans don't eat. So we collect those from a butcher and a taxidermist. So they eat bear fat, which is a hot commodity, other mushers, like in Alaska, people will ask us to bring some up for them. Um, they eat a lot of venison, a lot of sort of local wild meat um, and supplements and it, it is, they eat better than I do for sure. I definitely cook more for them than I do for myself. Um, but that is, that is a huge project. And uh, well, yeah, well, one of the, one of the lines of copy, um, I don't know if I read it in the, in the book or in some of our promo copy, but it just says that the, you know, the book shows the infectious joy of sled dogs living their best sled dog lives. And, um, you know, with you and your husband, caring for them, it's very clear that um, that's exactly what they're doing. I, I wish we had more time to, uh, to talk to you more because it's just, it is so fascinating. Um, and uh, and I, we didn't even get to talk about your, your, your appearance on Naked and Afraid, which is what I wanted to talk to you about, but we'll have to come <laughs> back time. and talk, <laughs> talk more about you and your husband appearing on Naked and Afraid. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to mention that your um, this is uh, your first, your memoir, Welcome to the Goddamn Ice Cube, which is back in 2016, received rave reviews uh, from people in the New Yorker and the New York Times uh, book review, and that you write for the Times and outside and other venues. And um, Blair, thank you so much. Thank you to you and to your husband, uh, Kintz, for, um, for, for writing this book, for, for pulling the veil back on um, such an interesting uh, such an, this interesting part of life. Uh, this is uh, the love that you uh, have for these these dogs is just palpable and you can see it on every page and every photograph. The book is out in October so folks don't have to wait too long to get it. And so I thank you and I'm not sure if you're coming back after uh, we hear from Alice but I hope that you do and uh, thank you so so much for talking to us today about thank, dogs thank on you the so much and thank you to everyone listening um thank and you. i can't wait to hear alice i'm excited all right Thanks, Blair. thank you i have 10 million other questions for i us. know <laughs> I, 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 keep thinking about, I keep thinking about um rudolph the red-nosed reindeer <laughs> this quote has me with all the feels. Wendy Wimmer Shukar. I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name. Wendy says, as the mom of a blind dog, the story has uh, me destroyed at my desk. Damn it, all the feels. Really, really hit me. We're there with you, Wendy. Yes. Uh, yeah. And guess who we have? Alice. Hello. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed your time in the virtual green room, Alice Henderson. I did. I ate virtual peanuts and listened to Blair's awesome stories. <laughs> cool. <laughs> So we are not 
stuck to a hard stop at three o'clock, just so you know, because because it's we play the we make up the rules as we go along. So, um, and um, you know, we we want we had all those little glitches in the beginning. So we're just gonna go. We're gonna talk. Let me do a quick in, in, intro for you, Alice, and then we'll get right to your book. So, uh, your first book, uh, A Solitude of Wolverines, introduced this uh, suspense series featuring the kick-ass female wildlife biologist Alex Carter. Now, I only say female wild biologist because her name is Alex. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said female because a wild biologist is a wildlife biologist. Anyway, Alex ran into trouble saving uh, endangered species. Back then, that book received rave reviews from so many authors. James Rollins called it a true stunner of a thriller debut. Amazon editors picks for best mystery, thriller, and suspense. Um, and most recently was included in Robin Agnew's best of list in the spring 2021 issue of Mystery Scene Magazine. Now you're back with a blizzard of polar bears and Alex Carter. Once again, she's running into trouble saving endangered species. So now, Alice Anderson, your, uh, your backstory so um, uh, informs your writing. So you are a, I'm going to try and get it. Bio, acu nope, I didn't get it. Acoustician, did I get it? Bioacoustician, yes. Thank you. I'm so glad I'm not on Jeopardy. <laughs> um, and you're a sanctuary monitor for the Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust where you check remote cameras, you do mapping, you undertake wildlife surveys to determine what species are present and you ensure that there are no signs of poaching. You surveyed for the presence of grizzlies, wolves, wolverines, jaguars, endangered bats, and more. And this is what I'm getting at. You use all this information and this expertise in this Alex Carter series, which brings this authenticity to your work. And so, uh, folks, you gotta read these books. They're wild. And uh, they're, they're just, they're exciting and they're thrilling. And you learn a lot without feeling like you're being hit over the head with a bunch of information. It's just fascinating. So Alice, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today about your new book. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm honored to be talking to librarians. I, library was always my place of refuge growing up. And now I have about seven different library cards at various Bay Area and Tahoe area libraries. And I just love libraries and Thank you so much librarians for all of the wonderful hard work you do and that's my go-to place for research and for quiet places to write and I just love libraries so this is a real delight to be speaking to everyone. Wow that's very very kind and I uh, I know that they uh, appreciate that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about well, tell us about the series and tell us about Alex Carter and again it's hard it's hard to get, you don't want to give away too much joys in the read, but why don't you just give folks um, maybe a little piece of, um, you know, just a little background on Alex. And I think you should start with Solitude for Wolverines and then go to Polar Bears. Okay, so Alex has her doctorate in wildlife biology from UC Berkeley. And at the start of A Solitude of Wolverines, she's living in Boston um, and she's went there to do an endangered bird study, but that's ended now and she's sort of feeling like she doesn't really want to be in the city anymore and she really is her soul is calling out to be in the wilderness and she had moved for also for a relationship that didn't work out so she gets a call from one of her professors and he has a gig lined up for her studying wolverines in a very remote wildlife sanctuary in Montana so she just packs up that night and flies out and finds her new digs, which is this super spooky old <laughs> abandoned ski lodge that's on this preserve. Uh, the ski resort had closed some years earlier and the owner had donated all of this land and the ski resort to this land trust. So she's stationed at this creepy place and has to go out and install remote cameras in the hopes of finding out if wolverines are still on the ski resort area. And they had been back in the 30s and later, but none have been seen for decades by the time Alex gets out there. So she's very curious to see if they're out there. Uh, but her remote cameras end up capturing images of 
a severely injured man wandering on the preserve. And as Alex goes out to explore that, then everything just kind of <laughs> goes goes crazy. And there's a lot of suspense. And uh, she tries to figure out what's exactly going on in this preserve. And that really, that was, uh, that set off the whole trajectory in this whole series now that, uh, so, so in the new book, she ends up sort of wrapping up things in that creepy place. And now she has a new assignment. So you wanna talk about that? Yes, so she's wrapping up her Wolverine study in the start of a blizzard of polar bears and gets a call from um, a fellow grad student that she had worked with before um, tagging polar bears in Svalbard. So the, this grad student who's now also has her doctorate and is doing her own research in the GC on polar bears wants Alex to come out to Western Hudson Bay to study a polar bear population there. So Alex flies out to Churchill, Manitoba and is lined up with a helicopter pilot. So she has to track these polar bears by air and tranquilize them and put collars on them and just to see what is the status of this population and are they doing well or are they suffering? And as a lot of you out there know, polar bears are not doing well right now. Um, in fact, the New York Times just released an article saying that all 19 subpopulations of polar bears are probably going to be gone by 2080. So Alex is very concerned about this and wants to know the status, but someone seems to not want her study to go through and start sabotaging her study. So she has to figure out who is wanting the study to end and they're willing to kill to make it end, so. Okay, that's so great a hook. They're both such great hooks. If you haven't read uh, Solitude of Wolverines, do. And you will see what, what all the raves were about because it really did hit the ground running and um, as is your new book. So um, so can you talk a little bit about your, your own experience? Um, uh, well, I should say that you've, you've also, this is not your only writing, that you've written several tie-in novels based on TV shows such as Supernatural and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and some horror fiction and some sci-fi. So you, this is not your, um, this is not your first, uh, Wolverines was not your first toe in the water as far as, as writing. But you, I don't know how you find the time to do everything that you do. So can you talk a little bit about your, um, your life when you're not writing? And, and how did these two worlds merge? I'm baffled and impressed. <laughs> well, I have always loved both writing and science. I've always been split down the middle between those two. I mean, even as a kid, um, I started writing when I was six. My dad, who was also a writer, um, and he gave me his old manual Underwood typewriter. So I started writing stories on that, mostly detective fiction and science fiction and horror and mysteries. And at the same time, I was so compelled by the plight of wildlife. It was that same age six when I learned what extinction was. And, and I just was blown away that it's not something that was happening you know, millions of years ago to the dinosaurs, but is happening now. And so I started just doing everything I could think of to try to help wildlife. Being only six, um, I did things like I volunteered at the local wildlife rescue and rehabilitation center, you know, mucking out raccoon cages and that sort of thing. And I would go door to door selling like coffee and little trinkets I'd made. And then I donate that money to different wildlife nonprofits. And then as I got older and went to school, my degrees are all kind of split down, you know, field zoology and then writing. And <laughs> so I did a lot of wildlife studies, biogeography and that sort of thing. But at the same time, I was pursuing my writing. And so all along, they were sort of separate. Um, and then when I got into bioacoustics, you know, I was going around to these preserves and setting up recorders and figuring out what species are using this land. Is there, are there wolves here? Or I would also set up remote cameras in the hopes of getting animals like wolverines. And, and then writing at night when I came back to camp, I would be writing, say, my science fiction series or one of my horror novels or something. And then it just hit me, why don't I bring these together? I mean, I wanted to use every tool I had to address the plight of wildlife. And being in these remote settings where 
you're really isolated. And I just thought this is a great setting for a thriller. And thrillers are actually what I read more than anything else. So especially I love thrillers that have science or history in them, like the work of James Rollins, for example. So I thought, well, this is great. You know, I'll, I'll have to create a character. And of course, wildlife biologist came to mind and then I could use my own experience um, out in the field to like add some authenticity to that. So I was just really inspired to bring these two worlds together. And then I just had to think, well, what species do I wanna do? And I knew I wanted to do, each book would be about a different species. So I had to pick, okay, which species am I gonna do first? And wolverines, not a lot of people really know what they are and they're not doing well. There's only about 300 left in the lower 48. So I picked Wolverines and then I thought, okay, well, I want each book to be the group name and an animal name, you know, like a parliament of owls or a murder of crows. So I thought, okay, what's the group name for Wolverines? And I found out there, there isn't one. <laughs> they're so solitary. The only time they're really around others is with their babies or a mate. So I came up with my own group name, a solitude of Wolverines. And then I just started I would be on the field setting up my recorders and then I'd go back at night to camp and I'd started writing this book um, about Alex Carter. And I wanted her to be really strong and independent. She can fight, she can tinker. She's kind of like MacGyver. She can fix things and hotwire things. And um, I wanted her to be just on her own, just standing on her own. You know, no one, a lot of thrillers um, with female characters, they tend to have to you know, sleep with the main character or whatever, the main male character, but I didn't want to do that. I just wanted her to be by herself, you know, totally self-reliant and have this really strong female character. And not cowering. Yes. Which I love. I love that you do that. <laughs> Thank you. And I wanted her main point to be that she's this biologist, you know, not that she's attractive or, you know, so. Yeah. And Alice, I'm always so fascinated by research. And when we talk to authors, you know, research always comes up. But it's interesting with you because you research as a profession. I mean, that's part of your job and one half of your life. So I'm curious, like, about gaps between you and Alex as the character, and if there were like any anything special you had to look into that you were unfamiliar with through your own profession. And I also know you have photos. So if you want to talk about any of those, I can pull those up. Oh, okay. Um, there were some things about Alex, uh, some things I, I kept kind of close to home just to add authenticity. So, um, she, like, for example, Jeet Kune Do is the martial art that she, and I studied that. So, um, we have that in common and I fix all my own cars. So I'm kind of a grease monkey like she is, <laughs> but I don't know how to, um, Oh, that would have been a spoiler if I said that. There's some things that Alex does in A Solitude of Wolverines, um, some certain things she's hot wiring or fixing that I totally had to research that whole side of things. And, um, and I had to research a lot about uh, her mother was a Air Force pilot who taught her how to fight and how to use guns and explosives and things like that. So there were aspects of that that I had to research to add to Alex, which was fun. I, research is just one of my favorite parts of writing. I mean, you can really dig into this stuff. And um, for a blizzard of polar bears, for example, I was just bugging these <laughs> biologists that are up there right now. I was supposed to be up there, but because of the pandemic, um, I couldn't go up there. So I was asking these researchers just the nitty gritty details of tagging polar bears and getting these collars on them and, you know, being safe out in the field and using shotguns to, you know, scare, yay, polar bears off without you know, harming them. Um, and just so much research about exactly like with polar bears, it's not just climate change, I mean, climate change is the number one thing threatening polar bears right now. Um, they need that sea ice to be able to use as hunting platforms to catch seals. And they fatten up during the winter by roaming on the ice. And the fatter they get, um, the longer they can fast during these long summer months where they're forced to be on land as the sea ice disappears. And 
of course, the mothers, you see them here with their cubs, um, they're passing on, they have a very rich fat content in their milk, polar bears. So they're passing on this valuable fat to their cubs, but as they start starving, um, the adults aren't doing so well and then they don't have enough to feed their cubs. And so they're really in trouble, but, and they're also in trouble with environmental pollutants like lead and mercury are working their way in. Um, PCBs um, are just getting into their fat layers and they're not, so they're not doing so well. So I did a lot of research about that to add, like, um, I really wanted to both, you know, give readers insight into the plight of these species, both wolverines and polar bears. So I had to kind of walk a, a delicate line between, you know, telling readers a suspenseful tale, but at the same time, you know, getting some of this information out there. And these are pictures of wolverines. Um, they're a very large member of the weasel family. They kind of look like a little bears, a lot of people say, uh, but they're amazing. Uh, they only weigh an average of 35 pounds, but they can take on moose and fight grizzly bears off of kills. And they are incredible climbers. They can go straight up vertical mountainsides and straight back down as if it's flat terrain. And they're really important to their ecosystems because they, for example, in the winter, they're capable of, if there's an elk, say, that's been buried in an avalanche, they're capable of tugging that carcass up, digging it up, and then they feed on that, but also other species can too, like coyotes and other weasels, so, and foxes, so they really are an important species. They also can clean the forest. They will eat bones that have been laying out on the forest floor for years, and they eat everything. They eat the teeth, I mean, the bones, um, one researcher said he picked up a wolverine and just was like rattling around like a bag of bones in its stomach. So they're just fascinating creatures. And this is a wolverine habitat. I was out there doing a pika study actually for the American pika, which is a little relative of the rabbit that lives in these kinds of rock piles. And they too, unfortunately, like the wolverine are vanishing as the earthworms. So. So a lot of really fascinating wildlife research um, and taking in my own experience of being out in the field into the, these narratives. Wow, yeah, that talk, we were talking earlier with Blair about how beautiful the scenery, scenery was. And that was another thought looking at all these photos, just, man, it must be so nice to be so, so to delve into nature so much all the time in your day-to-day -day life and then, Kind of get to write about it so other people can do a little armchair traveling and you know do explosives too if they <laughs> want to <laughs> armchair travel that but it might be nice to kind of dive in and especially if you are like me and don't get out to the the great outdoors that much but um i wanted to mention your website because it was really great we were talking about that earlier and you have a newsletter that's really cool because you give like a lot of facts and and different things about nature do you want to talk about that yeah, I thank you. I put a newsletter together and it has not only just publishing news and like what I'm up to on the book end of things, but I give um, green tips of things you can do to help wildlife. There's volunteer opportunities, um, interesting wildlife facts. And I usually do wildlife in the news, like something that's going on right now with a particular species. And then I do a species spotlight. So I'll pick one species that really needs some attention. And, um, and I really encourage people, citizen science is just a great way to help researchers with gathering information that could help protect some of these species. And there's a, a website, SciStarter, um, S-C-I Starter. And they just have tons of citizen science projects you can contribute to, you know, from your living room. If you wanna, look on remote cameras to count rhinos in Africa, or and there's all kinds of neat ways that people can contribute and help these species, you know, even if they are, you know, sitting in their living room. So I usually have a, I always have a volunteer opportunity listed on in my newsletter and people can sign up for that on my website. And we've put that link 
to your newsletter in the chat room so folks can check that out. I mean, right now, if you go to the newsletter, there's a section on listening in on bats, the bioacoustic study of bats, which is so cool. I mean, you, I mean, you really make it fun. Um, and I think as I just went on to SciStarter too. So maybe we could, it's SCIStarter.com. And I think we should put that in there too. I think what's so cool about this is that, um, again, your background and your knowledge inform your storytelling. Um, uh, and uh, much like, like Blair Braverman, I mean, you, your, your, your interests and, um, and your, uh, your knowledge come through in these in these in the pages of your book um and um i i just think that this is such a great um it's such a great series can you talk about um what's next in the series and when you said that you're talking about like so uh wolverines and polar bears uh are um you know they're 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 in trouble um are you planning on making uh your next couple of books are you going to focus each one on a on a species that's um, that's in need of help, or is that is that part of the plan, or is it just what what comes to you? Absolutely, I want to pick species that are in need of help. Um, I'm currently writing the third book, and I chose mountain caribou for the species in it. And mountain caribou are different from the barren ground caribou. A lot of people are familiar with. You know, you see those videos of these epic herds of thousands of caribou running across Alaska and the Yukon. Mountain caribou are different. They live in old growth forests, uh, really high in the mountains, and they survive on lichen during the winter. And they have, they're really dwindling. Um, the southern mountain caribou population formerly was in British Columbia and then down into Idaho and parts of Washington. However, um, because of a number of factors, including logging is a problem on these old growth groves are being completely clear cut. And also the logging roads have allowed wolves, normally wolves uh, feed on moose and deer in this area. And, but the roads have allowed them to go into these very snowy high areas where normally caribou don't have to deal with wolves. And so the wolves have been predating on the caribou and the predator prey relationship is that when a predator species feeds on a prey species, the prey population dwindles and then therefore the predator population dwindles, which makes the prey species go up again. So then the predators go up again and they have this balance, but wolves aren't reliant. They don't have this relationship with caribou. They have that relationship with moose and deer. So as the caribou population goes down because they're being predated upon, that doesn't make the wolf population go down because they're feeding on moose and deer. So between this habitat destruction and dealing with a predator that they're not equipped to deal with, they are dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And Canada started like taking our caribou to try to put them into a safe space. And for years, conservationists were trying to get mountain caribou listed on the Endangered Species Act with no success. And ironically, Canada took our last caribou, mountain caribou, up to British Columbia, and then U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided to list the mountain caribou as endangered, and we don't have any left anymore in the lower 48. So that's what I'm writing. Uh, my third book about um, was Alex going up to this area of Washington where a volunteer on this wildlife preserve thinks she saw a caribou that may have wandered down from Canada. So Alex is going to be stationed up there to see if this is actually true and if a caribou has come down and what they can do to restore the habitat for it. And of course, there's a logging interest up there that's wanting to log some old growth groves that this caribou, if it's there, is using. So that's the third book. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hope Alex gets the caribou. Me too. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the bad logging men go away. <laughs> it's so uh, frustrating. It's so yeah. stop eating up the land, for God's sake. They were here first. And there's so little old growth left. I mean, it's it's really sad. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's so it's so important what you're doing. You know, I mean, you're as I said before, you're um you're informing us 
And I think this is, I, you know, I love that you, first of all, I love that you um, became enamored of writing and aware of um, your, you know, just falling in love with animals and nature at such a young age. And, you know, here's to your, you know, getting that Underwood typewriter when you were a little kid. I mean, that obvious, I love that story. And I just think that that's so wonderful how that has carried through with you and what you're doing now. I mean, you could look back at that six-year-old kid and say, yeah, I'm going to be doing something with all of this information and this, this desire to want to learn more and then to educate other people, you know? And so thank you for doing that. Um, not only for adults, but for kids, for sharing that information, that website that will get up there. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important stuff. And um, thank you so much for for that, Lainey, I think we have some questions before we yeah. sort of have to wrap it up. And I'm not, is Blair coming back on? I think she is, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But not, we're not rushing you, Alice, because we have questions. I just wanted <laughs> to interject my appreciation for you and um, and the love for this character who is really cool. She's Thank really cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was just thinking, I hope the title, I mean, obviously Caribou will be in it and that's just going to be fun to say. So hopefully, <laughs> yeah, can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, where did that go? Okay, we were talking about conservation trust earlier and they said, is it commonplace for a private land to be donated to a conservation trust? That's Absolutely. Crazy. Yeah, um, a lot of private landowners that they could do one of two things. I mean, they can donate their land just outright to a land trust, or a lot of times they'll just put a conservation easement on it. And in which case it can't be developed even after they pass away or sell the land, it can't be developed. So that's a great way to preserve these wild places in perpetuity by placing them. And a lot of the, um, the sanctuaries that I've been on with the, the Humane Society Wildlife Land Trust are a combination of these things, either donated or there's a conservation easement. And if you know you don't have a huge track of land and want to help out with this sort of thing, um, places like the Wildlife Land Trust always need donors because they, if they outright are given the property, they still have to pay the real estate taxes and everything on it. So, mm -hmm. so people can help that way. Um, That's interesting. Um, another one. question about how people can help Casey Davis with the extreme heat like in the pacific northwest how was this how has the severe weather impacted animals and if what if anything can we do to help it's it's really dire um this extreme heat waves and we're really starting to see the consequences of us not doing anything about anthropogenic climate change the it's incredible heat domes that are hovering over the country and has dried so much out and now these insane fires and it used to be that wildlife could move out of an area on fire but now they spread so quickly that we're seeing bears that are burned and animals that just couldn't get out so what you can do to help um, a number of things I mean things just with yourself um, you know think about your carbon footprint and how you know eat less meat is a huge one if in fact if every American just substituted beans for beef, just, you know, and continue to eat other meat, you know, just didn't eat beef anymore, we could be like 75% toward meeting the Kyoto Protocol of cutting down on our carbon emissions. So that's a huge one, eat less meat, um, drive an electric vehicle, that sort of thing. And then on a larger scale, we really need to get legislation through to get some renewable energy going here and cut back on fossil fuels and you know, completely stop using fossil fuels. So write your representatives and, you know, it may seem hopeless, but um, there's so much we can do. There's so much between not doing anything and like being someone like John Muir. <laughs> so um, speak out and write letters. And right now, Congress is in, you know, those Congress people are in their home districts. So call them and go to meetings and speak out and really, you know, every year when the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change comes out with its report, they're saying, okay, we're, in, you know, we're in for a disaster. We need to make these changes. We're serious this time and nothing happens. And next year, okay, we're really, really serious this time and still nothing happens. So we need to really put pressure on our governments to make these changes toward renewable energy. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. And I think a lot of 
you sh the comments are so great and some like Kim McGee said thank you for raising awareness and giving these great series so there's so much in it there's like all this action and a great character a strong female character but you also get all of that knowledge underneath so there's a lot of thanks for that um we have time for one more question one more question okay sure. one more question so Vicky Nesting our friend Vicky um she said how much time have you spent in the alaska wilderness to make the book the setting of the book so rich um well it's set in montana oh which book does she mean do you know uh she she said, I, might have, I i think both probably just i think she meant in any wilderness <laughs> okay. like how much you spend in the wilderness sorry yeah i spent so much time in montana which is where the first book is set um just, I've been going there since I was a little kid and spending a lot of time in these high country areas where the book is set. So many, 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 many months um, just put together up there um, for longer than that, probably years if you stuck all the months I've been up there together. And then the Canadian Arctic, which is such a magical place. Uh, just before the lockdown, I was up there for months, um, just loving it. It's, it's just an incredibly different kind of environment. Like, uh, the tundra on the Arctic Ocean, and it was just amazing to see all these different kinds of wildlife I'd never seen before, snow geese and black faced red foxes and um, caribou. I mean, it was just, it's a stunning place, and I can't wait to go back. It was amazing, and while I was up there, I went up there in the summer, and, and then just seeing the tundra, you know, it was all green, changed to these beautiful golds and reds of fall. And then as I was leaving, it was snowing, <laughs> kind of white out conditions, what, like what Blair was saying, I had to you know, stop. Of course, I was in my car, not being pulled by dogs, but um, you know, I had to just stop it. You couldn't see um, in front of you. It was insane blizzard conditions getting out, but it was just a, such an experience. I loved it. That's fantastic. It's really wonderful. I'm gonna go back and uh... And, and watch this again, because I want to I want to write down what you said about five minutes ago when you said there's doing nothing and then there's being something I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I think you said something like there. Well, there's somewhere between there's doing nothing and there's being John Muir. Yes, there's, I love that. I mean, you know, come on, we, you know, we can all do something. But I, lo I love that. That's quite the that's quite the invitation that who can turn that down to at least, you know, do something if everybody did something. Um, Absolutely. Know. And you know, I thought a lot of people I talked to, they just feel so hopeless. They care very much, but they feel yeah. so hopeless. They don't do anything. And that's why I say, I you see. know, write letters, contribute to citizen science. I mean, eat less meat. There's so much we could do. Um, and if we all just did that, like you're saying, you know, just. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, read some really, read some really cool books. <laughs> um <laughs> like yours um so um i you know what we, we said so, uh, we could go on for forever we can't so um but uh a blizzard of polar bears uh, which is out i think in november is it november or october november 9th november 9th thank you very much and the paperback month. for solitude of wolverines comes yes. out september 29th and that has a little ps section with extra bonus material some essays reader club questions um that is so perfect and maybe we could put that in the chat too so that people can see that that is very good thank you for telling me that um yes, it has step back cover too yes it does oh, well, great race because <laughs> it's endless i mean it's well I mean, it's just, it just, it really, it really literally took people, took people's breath away. It's really so fascinating and um, it smacks of such authenticity and it, it just comes through. So thank you for bringing us this wonderful character and this wonderful series. And we look forward to, you know, reading more uh, and learning more. So um, in a, the most enjoyable way. Thank you. Um, so let's, at this point, we'll bring back Blair. We can do that down to at least you know do something if everybody did something um absolutely and you know i've got a lot of people i talked to they just feel oh so i think blair the replays on your computer maybe they don't do anything and that's why i say you know right just hit mute and you're good there you go oh no but you can't mute yourself oh well <laughs> just to be on a different page right 
You, you just, yeah, if you just close your window, you're good. I think you got okay. it, Blair. How, you're fine. How is Alice talking on Facebook, but not right here? <laughs> a little delay. I, There's a little delay. I want to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> You'll have to watch the replay. Uh, hey, this was so, so great. Thank you both so much for coming on and telling us about your books. Really, I mean, they're just, they're just so cool. And we, and as I said, you can learn so much um, not about both of you, about both of you and how your books are informed. And is there, before we sign off, is there anything that, that you all want to say to, to librarians? To, anything that we haven't touched on as far as your books are concerned? Now's the time. I don't, I don't think so. I'm just like Alice, when you were talking about yours, I'm, I'm riveted and I want to read the book and I also want to sign up for your newsletter like yesterday. And um, that was, that was such a delight. Thank you. And inspiring also. Thank you so much. I love hearing your talk. What a life of adventure. I mean, it's just great. Plus you get to be around dogs all the time. <laughs> I hope maybe our like paths will cross at some point in the Arctic again. And wouldn't that be you awesome? Can, <laughs> you can jump on the dog sled and teach us about the conservation work you're doing. Yay. Okay. It's a date. Oh my I'm God, ready. that's so great. <laughs> this and crossover I, happens. We're bringing you back so you can tell us all about this. Trip. Yes. Yes. Videotape it. Awesome. Oh my God. That would be so all much right. fun. It? And I'm <laughs> sure that uh, you're, um, assuming that you all would be available to, if uh, librarians want to bring you to their library virtually, because right now pretty much that's yes. what most folks are doing. But, um, you know, I know that um, there's uh, there's great interest in both of your books. And so um, we can tell just from the comments in the, uh, the chat room there how uh, grateful they are and how appreciative um, and how interested and engaged uh, they are not only with these book, but, but books, but with your previous books. So keep writing because you have such fan bases out there and it's really, really wonderful. So thank you both so much. Um, so Blair Braverman and Prince Mountain, your book Dogs on the Trail, be out in October, and A Blizzard of Polar Bears by Alice Henderson was on sale in November. And we thank you both again uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, for sharing your time and your stories with us. So if that's all there is, then I think the only thing left to say is happy birthday, Lainey. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank happy you. Happy birthday. Thanks. I mean, yes. this is how I want to spend my birthday, talking about animals and the outdoors. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Well, thanks for being with us on your birthday. And thank you so much for having me. This has been a total delight. Well, thank you all so much. And thanks for tuning in. And next Tuesday, Chris Lee and I will be cooking. That's hilarious. So if we don't burn our respective apartments down, we'll be back at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time to show you what we've uh, drummed up from our various cookbooks. I thank God it's not in person. Um, <laughs> So until then, take care, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. All right. Thank Hello. you. Bye. It's great to meet you, Blair. You, so you too. Bye. It's great to meet everybody. <laughs> Thanks Bye. so much. Bye.